Welcome back to the Mike Huckabee Show on the Monday edition. Uh, you know, we use the word hero sometimes. Uh, rather flippantly, we talk about some uh, athlete who's great in baseball or football and say, oh, he's a hero. Uh, heroes are the people who do things that the rest of us just stand back in awe and say, how did they do that? How were they able to reach deep inside and do extraordinary, uh, kind of beyond human things and survive it? My next guest, uh, he, he'll probably be modest and try to deny it, but I'm telling you he's a hero. Uh, Colonel Lee Ellis, he is retired U.S. Air Force, Vietnam POW for five years in the Hanoi Hilton. A uh, remarkable book. He's been a prolific author, but his recent book from last year is called Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, Colonel, what an honor to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Governor. It's good to be with you, and uh, I think the word leadership uh, really defines where we are today, uh, the process of it and the absence of it at times. Well, that's been my real genuine concern. You know, I look at what's happening in Washington, the the failure of uh, really anyone to, to come to the table and, and bring people together. I, I do believe that's the president's role. I, it was certainly my role when I was a governor. It's part of what you, uh, you, you sign up for when you want the executive position. And, and yet, I, I, you know, I'm not saying all the members of Congress are completely faultless in this, but somebody has to step up and be leader, and that means putting aside a lot of personal feelings, bringing people and listening learning, uh, being willing to, to, to bend and give, and, and most of all, find out what it is these guys really want and what is it I can give to them that doesn't compromise my own integrity. I don't see that. I don't see it at all. So let's talk about what is the character of leadership that you see missing in the Washington debate right now? Well, I think it's courage, and I think that's evidenced by... Uh, the unwillingness to sit down and work this out, because everybody agrees it needs to be worked out. We need to get the government running again, and we need to take care of our fiscal responsibilities. But it takes a lot of courage to do that, and especially I believe that what's happened is there's just a lot of posturing. People are looking ahead to the 2014 elections, and they're trying to get an edge there. And so what you have is people... Uh, I believe, taking stances based upon what they think will get them the most political gain rather than what's best for the country. I think, uh, you know, the example of the POW camps, we saw time and time again our leaders went first into the crucible and suffered in order to lead us in, the, in honorable leadership and doing the right thing and doing what was best for our country, for our POW team, time and again, and that's what inspired, to me, they were the real heroes, and that's what inspired me and the rest of the guys was the leadership of the senior people who did uh, have the courage and who did the right thing. That's what I think is missing. Colonel, tell me uh, an example of the kind of leadership that you saw when you were in the Hanoi Hilton and uh, what you mean by somebody who stepped up and, and provided the template of behavior for the rest of you. Well, one example would be Colonel Robbie Reisner. He was the senior ranking person there. He was famous. He'd been on the cover of Time magazine a few months before he was shot down. He'd already been there two years when I got there. And as a senior ranking officer, once he got in, he took command. He organized the first really uh, extensive organization in the POW camps in the fall of 1965. And once the enemy figured out what was happening, they could see the resistance start to stiffen. They hauled him in and started torturing him and put him in solitary confinement. And he, by the time I met him two years later, covertly, he had already been in and out of uh, several types of torture, had been in isolation for as many as 10 months. And he was bouncing back, and one of the things he said is, I'm in charge, and here's what I want you to do. And he spelled out about three or four things. He said, be a good American, live by the code of conduct, um, you know, take torture to resist the enemy, but don't take permanent physical or mental damage, go ahead and give in, give as little as possible, and bounce back, pray every day, and go home proud. So it was very simple, but he led the way with it and showed us how. You know, you mentioned something a moment ago about uh, courage, uh, the courage to do what was right, even if it wouldn't be politically popular. And, and I, I watch this stuff going on today, and I'm not making the Republicans faultless, Colonel, because I think sometimes there's been a lot of posturing. People want to uh, sort of what we used to say in political realm is uh, playing to the gallery, which means that 
you know, you're saying the things that rev up the crowd and make them all cheer you, but it may not be necessarily very effective in governing. Right. Uh, and I've even said that, look, I, I'm a talk show host. This is easy. When I governed, that was really hard, and you had to really work hard at it to work with people that didn't really want to work with you. That was part of the deal. But I'm almost looking at Congress and thinking, some of these guys, they ought to just be talk show hosts because that's what they're more interested in than they are in, in governing. Governing, you, you do have to give up something. Isn't that part of negotiation that you aren't going to come away with everything that you want? Well, I think it is. And, you know, you ask about an example from the POW camp. We had situations where, like, somebody wanted to go on a hunger, thought we should go on a hunger strike. Well, we had debates about that and weighed it pro and con. And um, one time I remember there was a, kind of a negotiated settlement that we would try it for two days and then we'd see how it went. Well, after two days, everybody concluded that was a bad idea because we, we didn't have much to eat already, and so we were getting pretty weak in a hurry, and it was hurting us more than our enemy. So another kind of thing was the whether or not we should try to escape. And that was always a very emotional thing because we had one guy tortured to death and another one almost to death uh, when they were recaptured very quickly. But yet there were some guys that always felt like we should be trying to escape. So there was this ideological divide over the issue of escape that was always going on there. But we did have to compromise. And finally it was well, only with senior ranking officer approval and then after that one escape where there was the one tortured to death and about 20 men who stayed behind who didn't escape were tortured terribly, and some of them almost died because they were trying to find out what they knew about it. But then it was concluded that we would only try to escape with outside help. If we had someone, uh, special forces or SEALs or whatever, or, or in, indigenous people that came in and tried to help us, then we'd go along with that. But that was a, a pretty emotional debate, similar to what's going on in Washington right now, and it was kind of always there, but... Eventually, our leaders uh, waded through and made some good decisions, and we all live better for it. You know, one of the things that I'm struck by as I listen to you talk about those experiences in the Hanoi Hilton is that even though everyone was a prisoner, everyone had been reduced to the submission to the, the enemy who right. held sway over, there was still a respect for authority, a respect for rank. In other words, there was a, a pecking order of leadership, and people understood that you couldn't have everyone in the ranks being the leader. Somebody had to, to take charge. So that, that's somewhat of a surprise, because I think we just assumed that everybody was uh, sort of this egalitarian uh, kind of world there. But even then, there was still um, a, a hierarchy of order. Oh, definitely there was, and there has to be, because without leadership and order, you know, you you kind of deteriorate in a hurry, and you don't have the strength. There's a great deal of strength in being organized and having leadership and uh, a good team under that leader. So we recognize that and always uh, worked in that manner. But I think, uh, you know, one of the things, when I was working on my book, the first uh, six months of it, I had the working title was Leaders Go First. And then eventually I realized that that really was not the major, that our leaders did always go first, but that really wasn't the major theme of the book. It was more leading with honor because our goal was to return with honor, and they led us in that process. But when you think about it, leaders do have to go first, and they did there, and that's what we're missing right now is our leaders going first to sit down and work this thing out. Colonel Lee Ellis is my guest, and we're talking uh, about all of the uh, lack of leadership in Washington, but his book is just about leadership, and it's one that I heartily recommend to you. Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, his website is leeellis.us. And, and Colonel, I, I've heard many times the story that one of the phrases that was often repeated among the POWs in Hanoi uh, was the three words, return with honor. Was was that in fact often sort of the uh, just the, the call for uh, continuance, just to return with honor? Did did that in fact happen like that? Well, it, it kind of evolved. Initially, it was resist, survive, and return with honor, and then eventually it kind of just fell out as return with honor because that captured our mission was to return our vision and our values with honor. So it really just boiled down to return with honor. We had to resist and survive in order to do that. 
But that was so important to us. We wanted to go home desperately, but we wanted to do it in the right way. And uh, on our terms, with honor, being released by uh, an agreement with our government or some plan like that, we didn't want to be released to um, an anti-war group as a propaganda ploy, which they tried to do with several of us. Uh, you know, and they did with several. And you may remember that that's one of the great courageous things that uh, Senator McCain did was he refused to go home early, even though he probably could have justified it, and I think he would have been accepted because he was probably the most seriously wounded and injured guy uh, amongst our group. Was there any particular person who coined that phrase? Did it evolve, or was there someone who originated it? Uh, you know, I can't tell you that, but I think it mainly evolved. The idea of okay. honor and serving honorably is, you know, deep in the military culture anyway, so... I think it's just there, and I think it's part of our code of conduct. Uh, you know, our code of conduct, we have six articles in our code of conduct specifically for uh, fighting military men, warriors, and part of that is, a big, most of that is oriented toward the POW situation. So that whole concept is wrapped into that, and uh, I just think it's just a strong military idea that we do the right thing, we do our duty, we sacrifice to do the right thing, to do our duty, and that's how we have honor is that we have courage to do what we know we're supposed to do, even when it costs us. Uh, one final uh, question for you, Colonel. The monuments in D.C., uh, the World War II Memorial, the Iwo Jima Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, closed off. As a veteran who paid a high price uh, for the freedom that the rest of us enjoy, I just want you to respond when you see those memorials closed and the World War II veterans on the honor flight uh, being told they can't come. You know, how do you, re how do you react and respond to that? Well, it's pretty upsetting to me, to be honest with you. Uh, I just feel like that's over the top. Uh, I, I cannot think of any reason. You know, those memorials, uh, there's no fence around them. I don't think I've been to the Vietnam Memorial. There was no fence around it. So why should we re be restricted from walking up to it and reading the names of our lost soldiers and visiting those areas? It shouldn't really cost anybody anything. And even if it did, we should be willing to pay it. And so I think, uh, you know, that really bothers me. It, it seems over the top and makes me wonder, uh, are we being made to feel the pain uh, for political purposes there? Well, I appreciate that uh honest answer and uh, i want to remind our listeners the book is called leading with honor leadership lessons from the hanoi hilton uh, colonel lee ellis is the author his website is lee ellis dot us uh, colonel again i want to thank you for the uh, privilege of having you on the show it's been uh, our extraordinary pleasure and honor to uh, to welcome you here thank you governor Huckabee. always good to be with you thank you uh you know, I, I just get such inspiration and encouragement from the stories of these folks who uh, served in Vietnam, were POWs, were tortured brutally, and they came back to some of the most remarkable careers in business and in the military and in politics. Uh, it, it is stunning. And if you, I think taken as a whole, you look at these folks who went through that experience and... Uh, there's, there's just a remarkable story of human courage that permeates every one of those lives. Um, it's the kind of courage we need right now in, in politics and in government. We need it in the, all this uh, incredibly stressful environment in which people are more interested in their own personal political futures and fortunes than they are in whether or not the country, our, our great United States of America even survives. And truly, there's a lot on the line. We, we continue just to spend money, borrow money. A lot of it is not done because it's actually helping people. We're doing it because it's political payoffs. We're buying votes. It's about purchasing the goodwill of people, hoping that they won't understand that they're being used by these ridiculous high payments that are costing them their freedom in the name of giving them something that the government says they can have for free.